Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. Today we have Richard Duncan. He is the Chief Economist at Black Horse Asset Management in Singapore. He's the author of numerous books, including The New Depression, The Breakdown of the Paper Money Economy, and also The Dollar Crisis, Causes, Consequences, Cures, which was an international bestseller that predicted the current global economic disaster with extraordinary accuracy. He's also worked as Global Head of Investment Strategy at ABN AMRO Asset Management in London, and also as a Financial Sector Specialist for the World Bank in Washington. And also during the Asia crisis, he served as a consultant for the IMF. He's appeared frequently on CNBC, CNN, BBC, Bloomberg Television, and other media news outlets. And he runs the blog called RichardDuncanEconomics.com. That's his main focus now, is on a video newsletter service called Macro Watch, which is available to our listeners at 50% discount using the code word authority and uh, Richard will describe more about that later. Welcome Richard. Richard thank you for having me uh, back on the program. Let's begin by what Richard is very famous for and that is the coining of the word creditism. I'd like to give a quote from one of his writings last year in which he describes creditism versus capitalism. Richard writes, I coined the term creditism to describe an economic system driven by credit creation and consumption, in contrast to capitalism, which was driven by investment and savings. Creditism replaced capitalism when money ceased to be backed by gold nearly five decades ago, but creditism requires credit growth to survive. The evidence presented suggests that Creditism is in crisis globally because credit is no longer increasing fast enough to drive global growth, even with record low interest rates. It is not possible to understand the global economic crisis without taking account to the exhaustion of creditism. Richard, do you still feel this way? And what are your current thoughts at the moment on on the creditism trend? Well, yes, that's that's exactly right. I think once we stopped backing money with gold in 1968, then the nature of our economic system changed very profoundly. Afterwards, credit growth became the driver of economic growth. When we were still on a gold standard, there were constraints as to how much credit could be created. But after we stopped backing money with gold, all, all of those constraints were removed and credit absolutely exploded. Total credit or total debt with two sides of the same coin. In the United States, total credit first went through $1 trillion in 1964, and now it's 66 trillion. So it's expanded 66 times in just over 50 years. So this extraordinary explosion of credit in the US has completely transformed the global economy. It ushered in the age of globalization, uh, it allowed countries like China to, to be revolutionized from a very poor developing country into the second largest economy in the world. But what I've seen is that any time credit grows by less than 2%, now this is adjusted for inflation, but any time credit has grown by less than 2% in the U.S. going back to 1950, the U.S. goes into a recession. And the recession doesn't end until we get another big surge of credit expansion. So it's crucial to be able to forecast credit growth if you want to understand what's going to happen in terms of economic growth. So I I focus a lot in my work in MacroWatch, my my video newsletter, on forecasting credit growth. And it's been very weak since 2008. We've hit the point now where the private sector the households are so heavily in debt that they just can't continue taking on enough new additional debt 
to, to make credit expand enough to drive the economy. And so this is this is the real point. Uh, once credit started to contract in 2008, then the, the global economy began to spiral into a new Great Depression, really. And it was only the expansion of government debt that prevented that from occurring. Government, U.S. government debt has more or less doubled since 2008. It's roughly $19 trillion now. And that it was the expansion of the government debt that, tep, that kept total credit expanding and that prevented the world from collapsing into a depression. But now looking ahead, if you look out at all the indust all the very the largest sectors of the economy to see how much credit we can expect them to uh, increase their credit by over the next few years, what we see is it's going to be very difficult for credit to expand by enough to generate strong economic growth. Based on my projections, I'm only looking for 2% credit growth this year and less than that next year. So that suggests that the U.S. economy could go back into recession this year. The key as to what is going to happen next to the U.S. economy and the global economy is interest rates. Interest rates are crucial uh, to uh, the future of creditism, as I call it. Now, if you look back, going back to 1980, interest rates in the United States have come down very steadily. Uh, the federal, the U.S. 10-year government bond yield in the early 80s was as high as 15 percent. Now it's come down to, well, it's something like 2.2 percent today. And as the interest rate fell, as it became lower and lower, this made borrowing more affordable. So the Americans were able to afford more debt. So they became increasingly indebted. And we can see this by looking at the ratio of total debt to GDP in the United States. In 1980, it was only around 150% total debt to GDP. Now, when I talk about total debt or total credit, I mean all the debt in the country, the government debt, the household sector debt, the corporate debt, um, financial sector debt, all the debt. So it went from 150% of GDP in 1980. Now it's above 350%. So as credit expanded, the credit growth drove the economic growth in the United States. And as the U.S. economy expanded, U.S. imports from other countries grew, and that drove the global economy. But now we've hit the point where interest rates are very low, 2.2% on the 10-year government bond yield. If they now start to move higher, then credit's going to contract, and that's going to throw the world back into a very severe recession. So that's, that's one point. Interest rates are key. Now, another reason that interest rates are key is that as interest rates have fallen, asset prices have gone up. So asset prices, the stock market, the property market, bond prices, they've all gone higher as interest rates have gone lower. The best measure of total wealth in the United States is called household sector net worth. And household net worth is now $90 trillion. It's gone up by 60% since the post-crisis low in 2009. It's now $35 trillion higher than it was in 2009. The reason this wealth has expanded is because the government and the Fed took very aggressive action to reflate the global economy after 2008. In 2008, the global economic bubble almost imploded into a new depression. But the Fed and central banks around the world, for that matter, cut interest rates to near 0%. And on top of that, they began creating trillions of dollars of fiat money through various quantitative easing programs. So this pushed the stock market back up, it pushed property prices back up, and it reflated the global economy. But now we've gotten to the point where the asset prices are very stretched. And... The way to measure that, one of the best ways to determine that is a ratio of household net worth that I just mentioned, now $90 trillion, household net worth divided by disposable personal income. So in other words, it's net worth to income, or in other words, it's wealth to income. It's a ratio of wealth to income. 
Now, going back to 1950, this wealth to income ratio has averaged about 525%. But in, during the NASDAQ bubble around the year 2000, this ratio went up to 625%, and then it popped. The bubble popped, and so the wealth fell, and the ratio went back to its normal level. But then a, a decade later or less, it, during the property bubble, this ratio went all the way up to 650%. Then, of course, the pro property bl bubble blew up, and the ratio fell back to 525%. But now this ratio has once again expanded. It's back to its all-time peak level of 650%. And this is telling us that asset prices are very high. The stock market is very expensive. Property prices are expensive. And that means that if interest rates now begin to move higher, then asset prices are very likely to fall. Uh, when, when the bond yields go up, when interest rates go up, stock prices tend to fall because it becomes more expensive to borrow money to finance investments in stocks and property. So asset prices tend to fall. So we're seeing a situation now where interest rates are the key because if interest rates move higher, then credit's going to contract. And that's going to throw the economy into severe recession. And on top of that, asset prices would have a very significant correction or crash. That would cause a negative wealth effect. And that would also cause the U.S. economy and the global economy to go back into severe recession or worse. There are three really very important things that are going to determine which way interest rates move. First, it's going the budget deficit in the United States and then the U.S. trade deficit and also the inflation rate. So let's, let's take these one at a time, starting with the U.S. budget deficit. Right now, as things stand, over the next five years, the U.S. budget deficit is expected to average about $520 billion a year. Now, when the government borrows money, all other factors being the same, it tends to push up interest rates. If the government, for instance, if the government doesn't borrow anything, then there's less demand for money, so interest rates can be lower. But if the government were suddenly to borrow, let's say, $3 trillion, then that would suck up all the money available in the economy, and that would push interest rates to very high levels. So when the government borrows more, it tends to push up interest rates and crowd out the private sector. So this was always known in economics as crowding out. Government borrowing pushed up interest rates and crowded out the private sector, made it too expensive for the private sector to borrow. And so the private sector would borrow less and it would damage the economy. Now, this is all other things being unchanged. But for the last many decades, something very important has changed. Now, the thing that has changed is before the Bretton Woods system broke down, trade between countries had to balance. But once the Bretton Woods system broke down in 1971, the United States discovered pretty quickly that it could begin running very large trade deficits with the rest of the world. So by the mid-1980s, the U.S. trade deficit had blown out to 3.5% of GDP. And by 2006, this U.S. current account deficit had blown out to 6% of GDP. It was $800 billion at the peak. Now, the reason this is important is because the current account is one half of the United States balance of payments. Every country's balance of payments has to balance. So when the U.S. has a very large current account deficit, that means it will also have a very large surplus on its financial and capital account. In other words, it will have very large capital inflows. So this is like a family. If a family spends more money than it earns, then it has to borrow the money from somewhere or else sell assets to someone. So it's the same with the U.S. and its trade deficit. When the U.S. has a large trade deficit, it will have a lar an equally large, in fact, it's the mirror image, it will have an equally large amount of capital inflows coming into the country to finance that trade deficit. Now, the point here is that as the U.S. current account deficit became larger, then the capital inflows into the United States also became larger. And these capital inflows made it possible to finance the government's large budget deficits at very low interest rates. So 
For instance, in 2008, sorry, 2006, the US current account deficit was $800 billion. So that meant that we had $800 billion of capital inflow. Well, that was enough to finance the entire government budget deficit that year a few times over. So these inflows are very important to financing the budget deficit at low interest rates. Now, so what President Trump has proposed to do, at least during his campaign and still, is he, first of all, he, in, he intends to cut taxes on corporations and the wealthy. And at the same time, he intends to increase government spending on the military and on infrastructure spending. So if the, if the government cuts taxes and increases spending, then that's going to make the budget deficit considerably larger, one can only imagine. So already we're looking at a budget deficit of $520 billion a year on average over the next five years. Well, under this Trump plans to cut spending, I mean, to cut the revenues and increase spending, it's very likely that the budget deficit is going to become larger, several hundred billion dollars larger. So instead of being a $500 billion deficit next year and the year after, it's more likely to be 800 billion or perhaps even a trillion. And so the additional government borrowing is going to, all other factors being the same, it's going to push up interest rates. If the government borrows more, there'll be more demand for money and interest rates will increase. Now making this situation doubly bad is at the same time, the president has also pledged to eliminate the US current account deficit. Well, last year, the current account deficit was about $500 billion, which was roughly the same size as the budget deficit. And so with the current account deficit at $500 billion, that meant that the capital inflows also matched that, had to match that at 500, roughly $500 billion. So we had $500 billion of capital inflows as a result of our current account deficit. And that $500 billion of capital inflow, that was enough to finance the entire US government budget deficit. Now though, if President Trump does go ahead and eliminate the current account deficit as he's pledged to do, then that means he's going to eliminate the capital inflows. So that would reduce the current account, that would reduce capital inflows by $500 billion. Now, so what we're looking at is a situation where the budget deficit is going to become $300 billion larger, maybe $500 billion larger, but the money coming in from abroad to finance that is going to shrink by $500 billion. So not only will the government be borrowing more, but there'll be less money coming in to finance it. So that too will push up interest rates. And that, as we discussed at the beginning, higher interest rates would cause credit to contract and cause asset prices to crash. So this is the real threat to the US economy and to the global economy. If you look at the amount that the government debt increases by every year, it's larger, significantly larger than the budget deficit itself. You would think the government's debt would increase by the same amount as the budget deficit, but the government debt increases significantly more every year than the budget deficit. So the government is actually borrowing more uh, than is reflected in the budget deficit. In the early 80s, when Paul Volcker was crushing the high rates of inflation, back then the Fed increased the federal funds rate to nearly double digits. And the higher interest rates in the U.S. On, on U.S. dollar loans, that caused the third world debt crisis of the early 1980s. So there's a danger of that recurring. Now, let me just say for your listeners who haven't followed my work in the past, you, we are beginning from a very unfortunate situation. It's very regrettable that we have this global economic bubble uh, that now that we are living in. Uh, it would have been preferable if we had remained on a gold standard, uh, if we had continued to back money with gold and had never allowed the Bretton Woods system to collapse in the early 70s. But once it did collapse, then a global economic bubble formed as a result of the explosion of credit that came about afterwards. And this, this global bubble completely transformed the structure of the global economy. Now, I wrote about this in my first book, The Dollar Crisis. That was really the theme of my first book. It was published in 2003. And the theme there was that the U.S. trade deficit was destabilizing the global economy. 
by causing the trade surplus countries to all blow into bubbles and then all pop one after the other, beginning with Japan and then the Asia crisis countries. And now China has been blown into a great bubble. And in fact, the whole world is an enormous credit bubble now. And at the same time, the money would boomerang back into the United States as capital inflows, and it blew the U.S. into a bubble. And so it was all clear that this was going to end very tragically when the property bubble ultimately popped, which in the end occurred in 2007 and 2008. So I just want to make it clear that I understand that the reason we are in this crisis is because we went off the gold standard and because we allowed credit to explode and we deregulated the banks. But now that we are in this situation, it's going to be very difficult to work our way out of it without causing the entire global economic bubble to implode. So yes, the current account deficit has destabilized the world, but we can not eliminate it in the short term at least without causing a new Great Depression. So that's my starting point. The other factor that will impact interest rates is the inflation rate. Because people are not going to lend money for 5% if the inflation rate is 8%. The interest rates are always above the inflation rate. Now, the reason that the interest rates in the United States have been dropping for the last several decades is because of globalization. As the United States has bought more and more of its consumer goods in particular from countries with very low wages, the cost of those goods has fallen because of the low wage cost that went into producing them. So as the U.S. trade deficit became larger, we imported more cheap goods, and this resulted in a deindustrialization of the United States, but it drove down prices and the inflation rate moved lower and lower every decade until now, well, until last year, it was the CPI in 2015 was more or less at zero, CPI, the consumer price inflation rate. All right, now, the lower inflation rate made it possible for interest rates to move down. Okay, so, but now, what President Trump is proposing is to bring the factory jobs back to the United States and to per, perhaps put up trade tariffs. He used to campaign promising to put up trade tariffs of 45% on Chinese imports and I think 35% on uh, Mexican imports. So clearly, if you put tariffs on imports, the United States imports so much, it has such a large trade deficit, it imports so much, and overnight, all of those products are going to cost whatever, 20%, 45% more, depending on whatever the tariff eventually turns out to be. So that's going to immediately push up inflation. Meanwhile, if you try to bring the factory jobs back to the United States, then that's going to very quickly lead to full employment. And if you at the same time have a trillion dollar infrastructure spending program, that's going to create even more in full employment. And that's going to push up wages. And the higher wages then will cause higher inflation. So let me let me go back in history and describe what happened during the 1960s when President Johnson started spending too much money on the Vietnam War and simultaneously on his great society welfare programs within the United States. So this at that time. The U.S. was still, we were still under the Bretton Woods system. The U.S. didn't have trade deficits. So the U.S. economy was more or less largely a closed economy. And when President Johnson started spending too much money and running larger than normal budget deficits, these, the spending overstimulated the U.S. economy. And very quickly, we had full capacity utilization in most industries. The steel capacity, the car capacity was all fully utilized. And we had full employment. So we started getting higher inflation rates and higher wages. And we, this eventually moved us into a wage push inflation spiral because President Nixon followed Johnson with more of the same policies that even more aggressively. So by the 1970s, we, we had very high rates of inflation. Uh, and that was extremely damaging to the U.S. economy. 
And ultimately, Paul Volcker had to crush those inflation rates by pushing interest rates up to nearly double digit to 20 percent. Now, so then what happened next is this higher interest rates under Volcker caused an a very severe recession in the early 80s in the United States. Unemployment went up to 10 percent. But in 1981, President uh, Reagan was elected. And soon after that, President Reagan started running even larger budget deficits, much larger budget deficits than Johnson had. Reagan had budget, de but Reagan was supposed to be a conservative Republican budget deficit hawk. But in the end, he ran the largest peacetime budget deficits in history up until that point. His budget deficits equaled 5% of US GDP for five years in a row. And that should have resulted in a new round of high inflation, but it didn't. Something important had changed. And the thing that had changed was that the US, by that point, we'd gone off the Bretton Woods system and we started running very large trade deficits in the 1980s. And so instead of hitting full domestic, instead of Reagan's budget deficits overstimulating the economy by running up against domestic bottlenecks, we were able to circumvent those domestic bottlenecks by buying our goods from overseas. And in the global economy, there's near, nearly limitless capacity. For instance, out of the 7 billion people on Earth, 2 billion of them are said to live on less than $3 a day. So we have nearly infinite labor capacity, low cost labor capacity. Plus now China has so much excess industrial capacity of all types, as long as the global economy remains an open economy, then we're not going to have any inflationary pressures for decades. So, but what President Trump is proposing to do is to take us back to the Johnson years, where we eliminate the current account deficit. We would once again have a more or less closed domestic US economy and then his stimulus, fiscal stimulus, tax cuts, increased government spending, and bringing the jobs back to America, all of those things would be highly inflationary. And so we would once again be back, and we wouldn't be, and that would lead to, would run up against domestic bottlenecks, and that would lead to very high rates of inflation very quickly. And the higher inflation would then lead to very high interest rates. And again, the high interest rates would cause credit to contract, asset prices to crash, and we would once again be in a 2008 recession scenario or something very much worse than that. In the 70s, when we had stagnation, the level of debt in the country was far, far lower than it is now. So the economy is much more vulnerable now. It's a much larger bubble. And it's not just the US bubble. We have a, a global bubble. And so, for instance, if China, take China, the U.S., China has a $1 billion a day trade surplus with the United States. Last year, last couple of years, China's trade surplus with the U.S. has been $350 billion a year, a third of a trillion dollars a year. Now, these trade surpluses are the thing that has completely transformed China's economy. China's economy is entirely structured around export-led and investment-driven growth. But now the global economy is too weak to continue absorbing more and more Chinese exports every year. And so there's no point for China to continue investing more in industrial capacity within China every year because it already has massive excess capacity across all of its industries. So China's economy, its economic growth model is already in crisis. And if President Trump now eliminates China's trade surplus with the United States, as he has pledged to do, then this could very easily tip China into a, a depression, an extreme depression. And the consequences of that could be very dire. If suddenly we eliminate China's trade surplus with the US, then literally tens of millions of Chinese factory workers are going to lose their jobs. This could cause social instability within China and it could threaten the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. And there, no one should underestimate 
how strongly they might react to a threat like that. And for instance, in 1941, in the summer, the United States imposed an oil embargo on Japan. And six months later, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. So it's not inconceivable that the sort of trade regime that President Trump is proposing could have very dire geopolitical military consequences. When the bubble popped in 2008, it was reflated by the US government. The US government had budget deficits that exceeded a trillion dollars a year for three or four years in a row. And as I mentioned earlier, the government debt has doubled since then. It's grown by nearly $10 trillion. And one third of that increase in government debt was financed by paper money creation by the Fed in its three rounds of quantitative easing. Now, the U.S. government debt now is roughly 105% of U.S. GDP. So it's say 100% of GDP. Could, so if, if our bubble pops, can, could the government reflate it again as they did after 2008? Well, possibly yes. And for, for example, look at Japan. Japan's economic bubble popped 27 years ago in 1990. And in 1990, Japan's government debt was 60% of GDP. But now, every, every year since the, the, their bubble popped, they've had very, very large budget deficits. And they've taken their government debt to GDP ratio up to now 250% of GDP. The US government debt is only 100% of GDP. So it's quite possible that the US government debt could become very much larger and keep the US economy and the US bubble and the global economy, the global economic bubble inflated for many years into the future by having larger budget deficits. But whether or not that would ultimately be sustainable depends on how the government spends the money. If the, Japan spent all of this government budget deficits and increased government debt, they say Japan spent the money building bridges to nowhere and paving the Japanese countryside with cement, doing a lot of unnecessary infrastructure projects. Well, it's true, Japan has fantastic infrastructure, but if they had realized that they were going to spend that much money over a quarter of a century, they could have spent the money more wisely by investing in new industries and new technologies on a very aggressive scale. And if they had done that, Japan would now probably be the global economic superpower, but they didn't. So the US now is facing the same choice. We could spend a lot of money uh, on the military, for instance. We could have another war. We could invade, pick your country. Any, any, you know, it has to be a medium-sized country. Venezuela is too small. China is too big. Pick somebody in the middle. We could invade Iran and spend another three or five trillion dollars that way, and that would stimulate the U.S. economy. That would keep the U.S. economy growing. That would keep the global economy growing. But ultimately, all of that money would be wasted. Would it not to mention the most important fact that we'd end up killing so many people and result producing even more enemies than the United States has already. Entirely counterproductive. That's one way to stimulate the economy, the old fashioned way, war. Or another way would be instead of blowing all this money up in cruise missiles, we could take that money instead and invest it in 21st century industries and technologies. We could invest a trillion dollars over the next 10 years in developing renewable green solar energy. Plus, we could spend another trillion dollars investing in genetic engineering and biotech and nanotech and other industries. And if we did that, we could then restructure the US economy and induce a new technological revolution that would be so profitable that it would pay off these investments many times over, completely restructure the US economy and allow us to grow out of this crisis rather than collapsing into a new Great Depression. I would think that if, the, if this bubble does pop, that it will be a close call, but I would bet that they will be able to reflate it again for some time. Because that's a sensible thing to do. We 
we have the policy tools to do it quite easily. If so, for, for for instance, if the global bubble pops, then there'll be much less global demand for things. Therefore, there'll be less borrowing. Therefore, interest rates will fall. So it'll be very easy for the government to finance uh, more government borrowing, more government debt, larger budget deficits, just as it was in 2009. Interest rates were low. Inflation was falling sharply. We were moving toward deflation. So it was very easy for the government to borrow the money and spend it. And by spending it, that stimulated the economy and that reflated the, the U.S. economy and the global economy. And they were also able to finance much of this with quantitative easing, with basically paper money creation. The Fed created three and a half trillion dollars from thin air and used it to buy mostly government bonds to finance the budget deficit. And so they would be able to do this again unless they just are too stupid to do it. And given that the congressmen, at least in the House, have to be elected every two years, it wouldn't take them long to realize that if we're in the middle of a Great Depression, they're all going to lose their jobs, whereas they could retain their jobs if they just have more government spending on infrastructure, for instance, in their hometowns, which would make everyone in their hometowns much happier and get them reelected. So surely they would do the right thing. Now, a lot of people just say, especially the... You know, the Austrian economist believe that credit creates an artificial boom and that ultimately that boom must bust and a depression must occur. Well, I certainly agree that they are right, that credit does create an artificial boom. It creates a, a global credit bubble in our case. But now the question is, is the depression inevitable? And the Austrians would say, yes, it's inevitable. So the sooner it happens, the better. But I disagree with that entirely. Uh, look, we have this bubble is so large that if it pops, the depression is going to be so severe that I'm not certain that anyone alive today would live long enough to see the recovery. So we need to keep this. We need to find a way to keep this bubble inflated for as long as possible and ideally to grow our way out of it. And. The bubble popped in 2008. That's 2017 now. It's been more than eight years. So it's been a good eight years that we've been able to avoid collapsing into a Great Depression and perhaps a war that would have accompanied it. So the longer, this may just be kicking the can down the road, but as far as I'm concerned, the longer we kick this can down the road, the better. And particularly if we can come up with a, a means of curing the crisis in the meantime. Because if we do collapse into a Great Depression, uh, it may be the end of our civilization. MacroWatch is a, a video newsletter. Every two weeks, I upload a new video, which is basically me doing a PowerPoint presentation describing something that I think is important that's happening in the global economy and how that's likely to impact asset prices. And MacroWatch, I believe that credit growth drives economic growth and that liquidity determines which way asset prices move, and that the government does its best to control both credit growth and liquidity to make sure that the economy doesn't implode. So in MacroWatch, I monitor and forecast credit growth and liquidity and government policy in the attempt to anticipate how those things are going to impact economic growth and the stock market, the property market, commodity prices, interest rates, gold, for instance. So I hope your listeners will check it out. If they visit richardduncaneconomics.com, they can sign up for my free blog or they can subscribe to MacroWatch. As you said, if they use the discount coupon code authority, they can obtain a 50% discount on a one-year MacroWatch subscription. So thank you very much for having me on the show. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Your insights are great. And we hope to have you on the program show soon in the near future again. Thank you once again, Richard. Bye-bye. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities.
The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk. 